Okay, ladies and, and, and gentlemen, or as we say in Czech Republic, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, 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 today we're going to be doing this in English because we have guests from far away and our language didn't yet make it to the peloton of the first most important languages in the world. But we are closing and I hope this debate will help uh, to bring a little bit of the uh, global debate also to the attention of um, things that are happening here. I have, uh, I see great many friends in, in the audience. I, I want to welcome you to what we call an experimental bank because this is, you are actually on the, on the ground of a bank. It doesn't actually hurt as much as you think. And we're trying to sort of make this a debate place where people can meet. And for that, I am grateful to, to ERA. And um, I don't know, I don't, if, uh, John Hollows is here. I don't be him. But anyway, uh, this is our new boss who wanted to see a, a very enlightened debate, I hope, as it will be. Okay, so without any further ado, let me introduce my guests today. Robert Nelson is uh, my great inspiration. He wrote many, 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 many years ago uh, a, a book called Economics as Religion, which I really enjoyed. I'm giving it to my students to read in their basic courses to understand all aspects of economics, and I, in my uh, youngish naivety, tried to build and use a lot of your argumentation in, in, in my work. So please, uh, uh, a round of applause for welcome for, for Robert Nelson. <laughs> my second guest from far, but not that far away, is, 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 is Christian. Uh, Felber from Vienna, mostly, I understand. And uh, the main advantage of, 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 of Christian is that he looks, looks like me, <laughs> which, which we were thinking that we could maybe some days, if you're too busy or I'm too busy, we could, we could swap. Swap each other. <laughs> swap each other. Um, uh, uh, Christian is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a very famous Austrian um, economist who is devoting his time uh, to be practical, unlike me, I'm very theoretical. So uh, this is also one of the reasons why I dared to invite uh, you to come all the way from Vienna. He's also a dancer, uh, professional dancer. So for those of you who think breaching philosophy and economics isn't enough, you have a living example of breaching contemporary dance with, um, with, uh, with old economics, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So um, Christian, is an, how many books did you write? 14? That's more than any one of us here, right? More than me. More than, <laughs> okay. So that's, that's, that's a lot of books. That's more than 10, which is huge. Okay. <laughs> that's as high as I can count. So a great welcome to you. Thank you very much for coming also. And now my Czech guests of, you, of whom most of you already know, so I will be brief. Uh, uh, we have global stars, now we go to the local stars. Um, <laughs> the, uh, rector, ne, ne rector, I always, we know each other by the first name, and his name means the dean, you know, in Czech. No. Re oh, rector, okay, sorry. So, president, president of university. Tomáš is a um, psychiatrist yes. who has studied psychoanalysis, did I say it right? Yes. Good. Uh, and also a great friend, just like Václav Němec, who is a professional philosopher and a great attendee of uh, Mlinská Cafeteria, where we have <laughs> invented many, uh, I don't know, theory perhaps is too much of a big word, but we have invented many things there. So thank you for that as well. And, oh, sorry. <laughs> Last but not least, but you are youngest, is my brother. That's why he's called like me. Only, uh, only he's four years younger, and as I say, four years smarter. Um, Lukáš has studied uh, religious studies, and because the topic is economics is religion, uh, we couldn't have it without you. Uh, also a graduate of, of Oxford, where you studied international... Cambridge, Cambridge, Cambridge. Cambridge. Oh my God. Hopeless, hopeless case. The other university. <laughs> yeah, even, even, even better, huh? Uh, but your girlfriend is from Oxford. Yes. Okay, good. So he has it secured from both, both ends. Okay. So welcome to you, too. <laughs> the, 
But because today's topic was so interesting, we couldn't accommodate everybody who wanted. We have uh, very significant guests also in the audience, and now at the risk of skipping some, I would like to invite, uh, I mean, welcome uh, Standa Komarek, who's usually here with us. Uh, we have Senator Otrata, I see. Welcome. We have my teacher, Professor Ben Acek, also. Great, welcome to you. And Dandra Apal, uh, my great influence also. And somewhere hiding in the corner is Václav Bilohradský. Okay, so thank you everybody one more time. And the, 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 the way I suggest we do this is you will have 10 minutes or so then you will have 10 minutes or so, then I will have an unlimited amount of time. <laughs> and uh, then we go into the debate. Uh, I will only talk, and this is of course a promise that I will breach yet again, I will only talk when nobody else will say anything. So you better be on your, on your toes. And then after, after this, let's say, 40, 50 minutes, we will go and open the floor, of course, for you um, once the topic is somewhat found or established. So, please, Robert Nelson, Economics as Religion. Okay, well, uh, thank you for inviting me. Sorry, you need to use the mic because and, uh, of the screen. I should say that uh, we mutually admire each other because uh, I like your uh, book, uh, economics of Good and Evil, in fact, wrote a, a review of it, and uh, among its many merits is that it seemed to re recognize that uh, economics as religion was an important idea <laughs> to, be, uh, to be developed. And so I immediately recognized uh, someone who was on a similar wavelength, uh, which was part of the reason why I liked the book so much. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, uh, I don't have, uh, when we say we're having a debate, you might sometimes say, well, we have a topic. I mean, I suppose the topic could be is economics as a religion, but that might even be a little boring. It's uh, pretty, probably most people can agree. Um, but so I thought I would just make some broader observations. Uh, the book did come out in 2001. Um, it came out just in the last month or two in a second edition, but it's unchanged as far as the main text. Um, but I did add an epilogue in which I comment on the reaction to the book and then also on some of the things that have happened within economics uh, that relate to the, some of the main themes of that book. Um, but I, sh I should also think uh, uh, say that... Uh, but, you know, I'm professionally, I'm actually an economist, and I have a PhD in economics, and, uh, but even when I was in graduate school, uh, I felt that it seemed very religious, and uh, do somewhat rather dogmatic, and uh, my word, even then I think I might have used the word scholastic. Uh, another word that people sometimes use these days is uh, physics envy. Uh, so it has to be mathematical and have models. And so I recognized that uh, a long time ago. Uh, and so I got out of, actually, I was headed into an academic career track, and I got out of that track and went to work in the government for uh, 18 years at the relatively high level in an agency in the United States, the Interior Department, which manages a lot of natural resources. Uh, and when I was there, I realized that a lot of what was going on uh, in the government, right on the front lines of the policy discussion, was essentially a religious debate in disguised terms. And uh, so it took me a while to get up the nerve to write about it because I didn't really have any particular background in theology. And so I had to get self-educated. But anyway, the result of that was a book called Reaching for Heaven on Earth, The Theological Meaning of Economics in 1991. Uh, and then this book, uh, Economics as Religion in 2001, and most recently, uh, a book called The New Holy Wars, Economic Religion versus Environmental Religion in Contemporary America, 
which actually goes back to what I was seeing in the government, which was that economists and environmentalists couldn't talk to each other. <laughs> and uh, why not? Because they are, were coming from different value frames. And, and so eventually I have come to conceive of those as religious value frames and, and to write about them that way, which I've been doing now for 20 years. Uh, and I've also written quite a large amount about environmentalism as a religion, but a very different religion uh, from economic religion. Uh, so what is economic religion? Why do I uh, call it a religion? I mean, basically, uh, to sum it up in just, you know, the, the core idea can be described in just a, a few sentences, <laughs> that since the Enlightenment, uh, Western civilization has come to see people uh, as shaped, you know, not by original sin in the Garden of Eden, but by their exterior environments, and from John Locke and but many others. It's been kind of the core, implicit if not explicit assumption uh, that's run through Western thinking since the Enlightenment. Uh, and if you then say, uh, well, what's the most important part about the exterior environment that actually shapes people? Uh, it's the economic part. It's material. And uh, it's uh, poverty is what really makes people behave badly. N not eating some apple in some strange story. Uh, and uh, so that leads you to the conclusion that if you can solve the economic problem or eliminate material scarcity, you also solve the human problem because the human problem arises out of economic circumstances of your exterior environment and so if you can perfect it, uh, you can save the world. And uh, you can eliminate sin, because sin has material causes. And so you can see, you know, an extreme example of this in Marx, and, uh, which is by now, you know, pretty much accepted as, if you look at the writings about Marx from the last 30 or 40 years, they pretty much almost all call it a religion. And uh, the, uh, it's a religion of saving the world through an economic mechanism. But I haven't written particularly much about Marx. I just use him as a good example of what I'm talking about. What I've been doing is taking more, much more mainstream economics and showing how the attitudes and the assumptions that I've just described to you that are in Marx are in mainstream economics to the same degree. Uh, but they're much more obscure, or economists bury them in a lot of jargon and scientific pretension, but they're there. <laughs> and so what my books have been about is revealing how to see them. <laughs> and it helped a lot to be an economist, um, because uh, if you're going to show, well, the implicit assumptions that are so taken for granted by economists that they don't even know that they take them for granted anymore, which is to say they're religious assumptions, you kind of need to know how economists think. So it, it was a big benefit for me that I spent a lot of time in the economic world. Um, so the further aspect of my thinking, which is as it developed, was that since the Enlightenment, Christianity and the world, uh, to the extent it was dominated by Christianity, has increasingly faced a crisis of um, loss of traditional Christian religion. Uh, and so that created a need for a substitute. And so in my overview in which I write, I see, the, again, the, much of the intellectual life of the Western civilization since the Enlightenment uh, as the attempt to develop substitutes for Christianity. You might say that I think everybody has to have a religion. So if you don't uh, have it from Christianity, you'll get it somewhere else. I like Chesterton's comment that before people will believe in nothing, they'll believe in anything. 
and uh, I happen to think that's true. <laughs> and uh, and so one of the thing, one of the any things that they believe in is mainstream economics, <laughs> and uh, but uh, um, so anyway, that's kind of the framework. That's the core set of ideas um, that. Well, the, the one more that I should mention is that, uh, which is also a core idea in all this writing I've been doing, is that when people give up on Christianity and they turn to something called secular religion, and then when you start exploring underneath the surface of secular religion, what you actually frequently find is an implicit Christianity. And so Marxism, again, it's a story of... Uh, of progress, apocalypse, reaching heaven on earth. It's quite uh, similar to the biblical story. Uh, and, uh, but then again, I show or argue that this is much broader than Marx, that in fact it can t characterizes large parts of Western intellectual life, and I especially focus on contemporary and uh, economics. Uh, so, so it's not just that we uh, lost Christianity, but we, re re in a certain sense, we re rediscovered it without even knowing it was Christianity. <laughs> and so I have a lot of people that I would characterize as Christian without knowing it. <laughs> and uh, it's not, of course, that they believe in the Bible exactly, but they believe in core values like a history is a is a mechanism of progress guided by some controlling force, uh, which leads to uh, some arrival at heaven on earth. Uh, in the case of Marx, it's a, through an apocalypse. In other cases, it's much more incremental. Uh, but I'm, again, the I mean, if you look, for example, at National Socialism as well. I mean, it was the Nazi millennium that they were driving for. Uh, and, uh, so, and so I claim that a large part of the ideas which have really shaped history, once you start penetrating under the surface, you find this very Christian set of ways of thinking about the world. The equality of all people is derived from the idea of all people made in the image of God and other things like that. Uh, so, uh, so in a certain sense, uh, economic religion has filled a gap. Uh, but in my view, and I'm probably maybe going on a little too long already, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, in my view, uh, the economic religion is now about where Christianity was in 1700. <laughs> that is, it's fading. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, and ultimately for a very pragmatic reason. It, two, the, the two core reasons are is that it, it failed to be able to deliver on its claims to be a scientific mechanism or to really to be able to give us the laws of society which would provide a basis for human progress and that human progress could be scientifically engineered by economists who would be the new priesthood, employing their expert economic knowledge in place of the expert Christian knowledge of the old priesthoods. Um, and, but econo economics just hasn't been able to deliver. I mean, unfortunately, and uh, I can say that again as someone who spent many years being trained to try to deliver and I discovered it. I couldn't, but and I don't blame it on me. I blame it on the failures of the subject, and I'm, not, I'm far from the only person. But the other reason, which is even a more profound reason, I think, is that this idea that we are shaped by our external material environment has seemed, and, and that it's economic, and that if we can solve economic problems, that will solve moral and spiritual and human problems, no longer seems credible. And I would say that that's a lot of that is simply due to the history of the 20th century. I mean, we had an enormous economic progress from 1800 to 1930 or 1950. And uh, so by some estimates, the income per capita increased 20 times. 
And so what was the moral improvement in the human condition as of 1940? Uh, not too great. <laughs> and, uh, or even uh, in Czechoslovakia, maybe, uh, or in Russia, as of in 1980, probably not too great. Uh, and uh, even though Russia was relatively inefficient, they still had an enormous increase in material capacity from where they had been 200 years before. And so this means, though, that we've basically kind of, we're looking at a religion that sustained Western civilization in significant part, economic progress and the idea of salvation through material means. And, but if it's fading away, if you go back to my idea that people will believe anything before <laughs> they'll believe nothing, that means that they're going to believe something. And so the question from my point of view now, at some most fundamental level, is uh, what are they going to believe? And I don't have the answers to that. Uh, so uh, that's up to the next generation. And this is near where Martin Luther came to. We needed a Martin Luther right now, and uh, it's hard to summon them on demand, however. And, but anyway, uh, I, I do look uh, and, uh, at uh, uh, environmentalism as one of the main attempts to come up with a new religion. And so it, its assumptions, it, 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 it reverses the assumption that we save the world through progress and says that progress actually can do more damage wipes out species, we could even wipe out ourselves with atom bombs, which are a product of progress. And uh, so um, it brings a whole new perspective on the world. Uh, but I have a lot of problems with environmentalism, too. I don't think it actually really is able to offer a coherent theology. So in a certain sense, to sum it up, I see us as being in a bit of a religious vacuum now. But uh, that could, can be a very dangerous situation. Uh, for all of its bad things, economics, at least it did provide certain core religious functions that maybe every society needs. Uh, a basis in trust, uh, certain social solidarity, even if the religion is mythical, it could still be extremely practical and useful and important to the survival of the society. So if we don't have economics and environmentalism isn't up to the job, then, you know, in some ways it could be a rather worrisome situation we're in right now. Or even you could argue that overall my argument is a bit pessimistic. And uh, in the sense that I think we need this some form of greater religious enlightenment, and we need it soon. <laughs> and uh, if you look around the state of the world right now at the Middle East or Eastern Europe uh, or China and its relations with Japan, it doesn't look too good. <laughs> and it's actually kind of scary. And so my... Uh, my diagnosis, so to the extent I have a thesis that could be debated as a thesis, it's that our current problem, even in social and other, in geopolitical and international matters, our current problem is actually religious. <laughs> and uh, if we don't really recognize that, we're, well, it's, it's going to be hard to deal with the situation. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. So we want we wanted a social science, but we got a religion. So yeah. it's it's not so we a okay. Okay. So so it's not all that bad. Um, next is Christian Felber, the author of a book, Economia uh, Dobra, uh, Economy of Good for the Common Good. Okay. Economy for and I also see that you published something quite new. This, this means money in Czech. Same numbers, but uh, uh, it's just... So one of your 14 books. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, go ahead. So, yeah, well, thank you very much, Thomas. Thank you very much for inviting. Um, this is my fourth encounter with Thomas. I 
I got to know him at uh, our common publisher in Germany, um, Hansa Book at Munich, where I introduced. Um, it, yeah, I was there and I introduced you to the um, um, to the representatives and the publisher, because you had just um, had a bestseller in in Czech, um, but not yet in 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 many other countries. And uh, then we presented a book together in Vienna uh, at Imperial Palace, <laughs> which was a very nice. Uh, with Karl Schwarzenberg, who was uh, falling asleep during the debate, but just, <laughs> but just for 10 minutes or something. Yeah, yeah. And in the right moment, yeah, and he had a good meaning for Kairos, uh, which is the right moment to wake up and to say the right thing. Um, yes, and then we met again, and now um, it's the first time you're inviting me, and I'm very happy to continue the conversation. I have to admit, uh, I'm not an economist, uh, although I teach, I'm teaching for seven years at v Vienna University for economics and business, business administration, and I'm also building two MBAs on economy for the common good in um, Barcelona, Salzburg, and also German uni, um, high school university. Um, but uh, there is a, a, a very concrete reason why I did not become an economist, why I did not stu study uh, economics, although I'm very interested in the economy and also in companies, and uh, this machinery, <laughs> question sign, that we're trying, um, Adam Smith, that we're trying uh, to understand. Uh, I was always trying to understand the whole, so I wanted to study universal sciences. And I went to the universities in Austria and in Germany, and I asked, can I please study universal sciences? And they said, oh boy, you're wrong here. And oh, I said, pardon me? Uh, I, I thought you're universities, so why can't I study universal studies in your houses? And they said, ah, I bet you mean, ah, that's just our name. Uh, maybe it's just a union of those who teach and that, those that learn, or um, maybe the researchers and the teacher, but it doesn't have uh, further meaning. And, and, and excuse me, it must have a further meaning, because otherwise you wouldn't call these institutions uh, um, with this word. And etym etymolog etymologically, um, university is not only the un universitas, which is this famous union, but uh, the smaller word is the universe. And universe in Latin means, uh, comes from unum and versum, and means one single uh, verse or one single song, if you like, uh, a wholeness. And the universe, uh, university could be, um, according to its name, the place uh, that opens us access to the whole, to recognize it or to experience it. And that's what, what, what I'm, I was interested in, like Goethe. Goethe always wanted to understand what is the, the most intimate coherence of the universe. That was his motto, and I was interested in that. And um, by the way, understand also the economy, <laughs> but uh, also together with ethics, together with philosophy, together with social sciences, together with natural sciences, with ecology, and all together, and they didn't allow me. Um, today, university only offer access to parts of the whole. So I propose to rename universities in multiversities or polyversities or uh, etymologically in perversities, because to pervert uh, just, uh, just means literally to put it uh, on the other way around. Uh, and that's true. Um, the original meaning of opening access to the whole uh, is not offered at all anymore and they only offer access to parts of the whole. And this is what happened also to economics. Economics was once part of moral philosophy with Smith and his uh, colleagues 300 years ago, but now um, Thomas is uh, justifiedly complaining about the narrowing of the economic thought into mathematics, into the separation from ethics, the separation from democratic decision making, the separation from the ecological and broader, other broader contexts. And this is my approach to the economy. I'm, I try to re embed the economy and economic thinking in all these contexts the, bro the broadest possible cultural context, democracy, democratic decision making, ethics that uh, are in society and in constitutions, and the ecological context, which is at the end of the day, uh, the final source of all values and also of all economic values. There is no single economic values that does not come at the end of the day from nature. 
So um, maybe this is my religion. <laughs> you can also uh, call it holistic thought. Um, and this holistic thought uh, has always been in all cultures. It's nothing new. Uh, you can find it in, uh, in, with the indigenous people in Latin America. They have developed the art uh, of good life, El Arte del Buen Vivir. You find it in Buddhism, uh, where the motto is to take care of, uh, of the good of all beings in every step of your life. You can find it in deep ecology, where you should always consider the whole and not only your proper interest. And um, I'm talking too long. Um, I, I did not uh, study economics because I, I, I felt uh, there are very strong beliefs uh, in, in competition, in growth, in egoism. And these beliefs did not allow uh, alternative uh, opinions. So it was kind of religion, but without confession. That's uh, more or less what you are showing on your book. It's a religion without confession that is hiding behind objectivity. And this is very surprising to me because I learned at university, I learned a lot of good things. I studied sociology, psychology, political science, and Roman languages. But I learned that uh, objectivity, there is no such thing as objectivity. That's what I already learned. And then I, I, I conversed with uh, economists that really believed in, uh, in these, what are these? Are these values, competition, growth, egoism? Or is it just a paradigm that is composed by, by a setting of, uh, of, uh, of very strong cornerstones that make up these paradigms? Um, I also remember I grew up in a very small village in Salzburg, and when we fought, uh, now we are talking non-violently altogether because we learned to communicate in a non-violent manner, and I think it's really a progress for hum hu humanity. But when I still was uh, a child and a, uh, and a young man, um, we, we communicated in a different way, and we tried to be right. Huh? And uh, how, how could we be right? Uh, we were right saying, uh, what I am telling is the truth. Huh? <laughs> so, and uh, the stronger someone stressed that he, usually it was a he, uh, was telling the truth, uh, the, the more probable was that it was just his uh, humble, subjective uh, opinion. And uh, I recognize this pattern in economic thought. Um, we know how, how life uh, works, how the big machinery uh, works, and uh, and, uh, and there is the pretension of uh, objectivity of that. And this belief is so strong that um, I found in my interdisciplinary research that even if in other disciplines there is already a very broad and surprisingly broad scientific evidence that some of the, uh, the cornerstone beliefs of economists are not um, fundamented scientifically, uh, there is not even... Uh, a conversation with these other um, opinions. Let's call them other, different opinions. Competition is my, my favorite example. Um, Hayek, who is supposed to be a Nobel laureate, although the Nobel Prize is not uh, be given to economists, you, I think you know this, that it's uh, only the same day that this different prize is given to economists, but it's not the Nobel Prize, because... It's more important than the Nobel Prize. Maybe it's more important. <laughs> Maybe it's more important, but Alfred Nobel, who was the founder of the prize, said very clearly, this prize is only for natural sciences and not for social sciences. And as... Or supernatural sciences. Or super, yeah. <laughs> for, maybe, but then there should be a Nobel Prize for religion and for, redi for religious studies. Uh, maybe you, you propose this to the... Uh, to the yeah, exactly. You have it. <laughs> yeah, but it's not a Nobel Prize. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the, exactly, that's the substitute. And it was Hayek and his Mont Pelerin Society who applied for the ex extension of the uh, Nobel Prize uh, to religion. And Hayek, um, he's, uh, he's a great thinker, of course, but he said some things that, um, that are um, falsified by other, uh, uh, by other disciplines. For instance, that competition is the is the, the most efficient method we know. This is a quote from Hayek. Competition is the most efficient method we know in which meaning, in the meaning that it motivates people stronger than anything else. 
Uh, it's, uh, it's looks, uh, it seems to be a quote for which someone could get a Nobel Prize. But then I looked for the study, the empirical study, uh, with which Hayek proved this. And I didn't find it up to today. It's just a, it's just a belief. Uh, and what I want to say, there are about 500 studies with exactly this question, this uh, scientific question, which is the most efficient method we know in the meaning of what does people motivate strongest. And out of those uh, studies that have a clear result, 87% have the result that it's not competition. And the result is that it's cooperation. And, but these studies are not from economists. These studies are from, social, from other social sciences. From, so, so that doesn't uh, count. Uh, that does not count, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I think that's, that's uh, a symptom of the problem, that uh, economists are not too much interested in what uh, other, other disciplines find out. And uh, in psychology, for instance, and I studied psychology, it's clear that for motivation, we do not need competition. Of course, competition can motivate us. No one denies that. But we do not need it for motivation. And uh, contemporary psychology says that it's enough uh, for strong motivation that we find out who we are, identity, indifference to others, not being better than others, but how do we differ from others? That's not the, the exact question. The exact question is, who am I uniquely, uh, singularly? This is important to know. Then. I can live according to my needs and to my feelings and to my thoughts and to my intuitions. Second, uh, what are my gifts? What are my abilities? And it's a, a basic need to develop these competences. This is a second basic need. And the third one, the third one is to give back to the broader community what uh, I was gifted with. Religion, in, in Latin, uh, etymologically means to rebind myself. So I'm, I'm a friend of the word. Of, I don't be, I, I'm not a member of any religious community, but I love the word uh, to rebind myself to a broader uh, community. Maybe I'm against ideologies, and also, of course, you can rebind yourself to an ideology, and maybe this is where um, the, the vacuum uh, is that you stated and where the danger is in this moment. But religion, religion as a word to rebind myself to a broader community is a psychological basic need that is not controverted. And it is not proven sci psychologically that pursuing your self-interest uh, nor is motivating you stronger than other motivating factors, nor is filling you with meaning. And that's in, that's, I'm, I'm saying that because Adam Smith stressed so much that the pursuance of the self-interest uh, will, in the end of the day, lead to the common good. Um, and the mechanism, again, we are in a mechanistic language, the mechanism that provides for this mystery that uh, the egoisms and the pursuance of the self-interests of all people leads to the common good in the end is the invisible hand. And today, of course, we know that the invisible hand simply does not exist. Uh, and it would be uh, nice to find a mechanism that really provides that economic freedom in the meaning of uh, private companies and uh, economic initiatives leads, but for sure, to the common good. Today, and this is the tricky thing about Adam Smith's quote, this is possible. You can, through private companies and economic freedom, you can contribute to the common good. And it has been pro proven uh, millions of times. But also millions of times, uh, the exact opposite has been proven. You pursue your self-interest, you have success with your company, but you harm the common good. You, um, you lay off uh, thousands of people, you worsen the working conditions, you destroy the environment, and you subvert um, democracy. So maybe one of the questions we could um, ask for is uh, which could be this mechanism or this policy decision that guarantees that uh, economic freedom and the private initiatives leads to the common good in the end. And this would be a visible hand. And the Finnish translation, which is uh, by the university publisher in Helsinki, um, um, published of the economy for the common good, has the subtitle, The Visible Hand. So I'm very thankful for that. And I want to close with, with, um, with 
may a very uh, contribution to economic thought. Uh, from my broader view, um, I, I analyzed economic uh, thought and economic practice. And uh, I'm always asking in the first, like a project manager, I'm also asking, which is the goal? <laughs> which is the goal of the economy? And um, I ask students of uh, economics and business administration, and everyone is answering in Austria, in Germany, in Spain, even in Latin America, uh, the goal of the economy, well, to make money. The business of business is business. The purpose of founding a company is to, um, to make money. And I, then I ask, but uh, why do you think like this? And then the answer is, well, that's how we learn it. And then I again ask, but uh, on which sources do those who teach you this, uh, do, they, uh, do they rely on? And then they say, uh, we don't know. <laughs> and what I did, I uh, looked up in constitutions of democratic countries, which is the object, do constitutions of democratic countries tell us anything about the goal of the economy? Not every single constitution does, but all constitutions that tell us something about the objective of the, of the economy tell us that it's the common good and not the increase of capital. So the goal is clear. Also the role of capital is clear. The, the role of capital is the means. Common good is the goal. The capital is the means. And my conclusion is <laughs> if we want to measure success in the economy, what would be more intelligent to measure economic success alongside the disponibility or the accumulation of the means of economic activity or alongside the achievement of the goal of the economy? And today, how do we measure economic success? On the three levels of the economy, on the highest macroeconomic level, we measure the success of a of a national economy with the GDP. On the MISO level of a single company, we measure its success with the financial balance sheet and the profit. And on the lowest uh, level of a single investment, uh, there starts in economic activity, we measure the investment's success with the return on investment or the return on equity. And what do these three success indicators have in common? All three of them are monetary indicators, which means the unit of measurement is money, but money is only the means of the economy and not the goal. So with the money, you cannot meet, uh, measure the achievement of the goal. And uh, we, so in my pers from my perspective, I discovered a methodological failure of the economy because uh, there is nothing bad to measure the monetary indicators, but uh, we should at least also, and additionally, measure the, the achievement of the goal if we want to really know how successful an investment, how successful a company, and how successful a national economy is. And this is the contribution of the movement we founded three years ago, the movement for the economy for the common good. We are developing the common good product, we have developed, and more than 200 companies out of five countries have already implemented the common good balance sheet. And for every single investment, we propose to make a common good exam to know if this investment really contributes to the goal of the economy. Thank you. <clears throat> so... Uh before I give my word to my um, other, other three co-panelists um, and then to you, let me just try to sum it up in, in an example that, I, that, I've, uh, that I've read with you. Economics is, is, is like, like any ideology, it has its beliefs. To, to, to ask an economist about the invisible hand of the market, you have to ask him or her, do you believe in the invisible hand of the market, and the economist says, yes, I do, or no, I don't, but it's basically a belief question. Uh, and there is a, there is a fine, and it also has 
ethics of its own, like any ideology. Now, just because it has ethics, it doesn't mean these ethics are moral. We had Nazi ethics, we had communist ethics, we had all sorts of rules by which people were actually behaving and had guilty conscience if they didn't uh, behave according to these ethics. One of the saddest literature to read is the letter of, of, of Nazi... Uh, um, Gestapo writing home to their mothers that they feel ashamed that they have guilty conscience by doing this to, to, to other non-races. Non so what, what, is the, what is the ethics of economics? Because this has been the, the, the task of the last years is to try to give economics a soul or give it ethics. But I think the task is much more complicated. It already has ethics of its own. Uh, for example, rationalism. I mean, and there is nothing you will find in any of these textbooks about emotions. And this is a clear diagnosis. If, if, if you rationalize and you suppress your emotions, I think you're ready for, for one of you, if, if you do that for, for long enough. Secondly, uh, it is a clear advocacy of egoism. I mean, it, uh, e e economics doesn't advocate or argue with moral schools about egoism, it basically states that everybody is an egoist, whether you like it or not, and there's really nothing you can do about it. So egoism is not only the survival tactic, so egoism is not only okay, it's even in fact double holy. You serve your own uh, utility, but you are also helping, hel helping, helping others. Um, you will also find good values in economics. For example, this huge obsession with freedom or uh, this belief in responsibility of, of the self for, for your deeds which you did. So you can see, uh, uh, without going into much of details, you can see, a, a, if you think about it, you can see a perfect example of a actually quite highly developed moral school which is implicit. And the way, and this is your example, Robert Nelson is, has been the bible of economics for the last two, maybe even three, three generations. And this is the final example, and then I will shut up and give the word to you. The trick which you have so wonderfully discovered uh, is in the beginning, Ro um, Robert Nelson, in the beginning, Paul, Paul Samuelson says the, 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 the meaning of this book is for you to think like an economist. But of course, immediately you should ask yourself, yes, fine, but which one? Do you mean Hayek? Or do you mean Keynes? Or do you mean Adam Smith? Or, or Schumpeter? or Marx, or, or Weber, or was Marx not an economist? Where do, you, where do you, surely if you put all these economists into one room, one thing they wouldn't agree on is Samuelson. So maybe what really, um, what really Paul Samuelson is saying is I want you to think like I, Paul Samuelson, think. And me, even a more appropriate word, wording of the sentence would be I want to teach you to believe like Paul Samuelson believed. Now, why, and this is coming to your example, this is how it's done. We want to prove something, for example, that governments are less efficient than, 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 than market competition. And he goes through a very rigorous mathematical proof of that sentence. Uh, and he spends how many? Six or eight pages filtering a small little mathematical detail. And then he stops in the middle of this proof and says, but because we know that human beings are free, rational, utility-maximizing egoists, we can continue with our calculation. And at the end of the calculation, it looks like QED, which is quot erat demonstrandum, which is what was supposed to be proven. So what happens here is, unless you're extremely cautious, at the end of the day, you have a feeling that it has been scientifically, mathematically confirmed, but in the middle of that proof, he skips through thousands of years of philosophy, moral schools, religious studies, political studies, etc., etc., um, and he's, he discards it with, you cannot do these calculations if you don't believe that these assumptions or articles of faith are, are, are true. So anyway, just a small little example, if I may, uh, you, stemming from your work, how it looks like an analytical, mathematical science that sort of judges what is a posit positive and negative externality, but in, in, in fact it could also be considered um, as, a, as a moral school or, or religion or ideology um, in, in disguise. Uh, 
when what what embarked me on this subject when I was reading um, when I was reading Gary Becker, he has this he has this belief that you know we can look on churches like it's an economic utility maximizing unit, and it has been actually quite a useful look. We can look on human relationship as a seek for perfect match in, in capital, be it human capital or, or physical capital, with which I could only agree and say, okay, but let's then go all the way if it's okay for economists to look on religion and relationship as a subset of economic relationship, but then we should also allow the opposite view. We should also allow uh, to, to, to look on economists as a religious group entangled in, in very complicated relationships. Okay, so that's uh, from me. And then uh, uh, youngest, Tomáš, no, from, 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 and everybody else. Would you like to start first, and then Václav, and then Lukáš? I think Václav can start. Or just, a, yeah. <laughs> Please be, be quite brief. And, uh, and then we can go to the audience. Or I can have just one question. Why do you think that uh, economy, that the goal of economy is common good, not money? That's my question right now. Yeah, well, um, of course it's a, an opinion. I, I, I want to confess because um, this religion <laughs> is a confessing religion. Huh? And uh, I have to go back to the universal approach that I was doing. And first of all, it was an intuition. It was not more than a deep, deep feeling of connectedness with everything else. And it uh, had to do that, for me, it always was clear that the economy is not an end in itself, uh, but an instrument. An, ins an instrument at the service of uh, human society. Um, you could call it with Luhmann a societal or cultural subsystem. and. Uh, it's an instrument. And uh, this has the logical consequence that, that the human society has to give to the economy some goal. And of course, the goal can be, the goal of the economy is the increase of capital. Through the contribution of every single capital owner, uh, we uh, charge him or her <laughs> of increasing his or her capital. This is a quote of Adam Smith, that's why I'm saying this, Adam Smith. Uh, in, in my vision, um, really um, prepared the path for uh, the economic success me measurement in uh, monetary terms and in mixing up the goal of the economy with monetary indicators. This is one possibility. And my intuition said, no, uh, that's uh, just a part of the, of the whole. But the overall goal is the common good, which... Uh, is not defined by nature, which is not defined by God, which is not defined by Hitler and not defined by Stalin, but which only can be, be defined by the democratic society. This is my, uh, my precondition of uh, um, when I'm talking um, about the common good. But of course, uh, the result of the democratic debate can be, no, the goal of the economy is not the common good. It is to have fun, it is to increase the capital, it is anything else, it is efficiency. <laughs> Uh, or it is the common good, but then we have to define the common good. And let me make a very last uh, sentence of it. Only if um, efficiency is not a bad thing, as long as we know which is the goal. <laughs> if we don't know which is the goal, efficiency can be the devil's uh, instrument because we are doing better the wrong thing, <laughs> or we become more efficient in being ineffective. Only if we know which is the goal, for instance, if the goal is the increase of capital, then it is efficient to increase with less input uh, the capital at a higher rate. This is more efficient. But uh, we have to be clear about the goal. And if we say that the goal is the common good, and I'm already stopping, uh, <laughs> then we are only more efficient if we increase all components, all ingredients of the common good. This might be with more capital and this might be with less capital. I'm asking this question because it reminds me one of uh, the most important questions and debates in psychoanalysis. What is our goal? We are also an instrument and we are also asking the question, what is our goal? Is it common good? It's, uh, it's the perfect question because it's, sorry to say, it's quite a narcissistic answer for me because uh, it means that my work is a, allows me to affect the whole society, a lot of people. But I'm a psychoanalyst, 
I'm not philosopher, I'm not a priest. So my goal is my client is paying me because he wants to feel better. So he, my client is paying me because he wants to feel better. So my goal, I am, I'm his servant, and my goal is to help him to feel better. And I can hope that common good will be a side effect of my work. And I trust, I believe, that's my religion, that it is, that if the people are happier, the society will be happier. And I can go even further. I'm even not sure if my goal is to increase the good of, of an individual. I am trying to uh, help people to be orientated in their own mind, so to, to know what's happening inside. And I hope that when I can help them to discover uh, the dark side of the personality and the hidden parts of the personality, it will help them to be more free and to live happier. But it's also, we can say it's also a side effect of this search. And if I would be aimed on the good of the society or even for the good of my client, I know that I wouldn't do my job well because I will see, I will see a different goal. It will, uh, it will deformate the quest of searching the truth. Is it an, another question to me? Then I would say I agree with your approach. I think that it's truly the goal of a psychotherapist or psychiatrist uh, is the good of his or her client. Uh, and it's not a contradiction. Um, it's not a contradiction because um, we have a double identity, uh, human beings. Uh, we are, on the one hand, singular persons. And I will take a look on the etymology, etymology of person in a second. And on the other hand, we're social beings at the same time. And it's not a contradiction. Of course, we can make a contradiction out of it. And then we make or capitalism or communism. Because we only stress the individuality or we stress only the community and uh, exaggerate it into uh, socialism on the one hand or into individualism on the other hand. And that's why an US economist, uh, it was John Kenneth Boulding, said... Um, capitalism is a model of society in which human beings exploit human beings. And in communism, it's exactly the other way around. And, <laughs> and <f> for <laughs> me, this is so great because uh, it's a learning from history. I think it was necessary that we made both experience to exaggerate our social dimension and also to exaggerate our individual dimension. But in a first stake, I'm an psychologist, and I agree with you, um, um, following um, Jung, um, Carl Gustav Jung. And he said, the meaning uh, of life is to become who you are. So first, you need to find out who you are in your deepest uh, inner uh, singular personality uh, and become yourself uh, authentic. Person, by the way, but it's not... Um, is not a, a famous uh, celebrity, <laughs> uh, but person comes from per sonare in Latin in, in, and means literally to sound through. So I would say we are instruments uh, and uh, uh, it's no contradiction that we are at the same time a unique Stradivari <laughs> or any other instrument. And on the other hand, we only can resound if we rebind ourselves to something bigger. In yoga, they say that the spirit, which is not only the big mind, but also the breath, hmm, uh, by, rebinds you to the, to the bigger whole. And uh, to put it a little bit less spiritual and uh, a little bit less uh, religious, you, you can say that uh, you, all, you only can um, um, develop yourself and become a free person if you at the same time take care of others. It's very simple. But it's not only one thing, it's always both things. Thank you. Václav, so uh, how do you as a philosopher look on the question of us thinking that we live in the post-ideological society? I'm sorry, I'm not uh, an economist uh, and psychologist, but philosopher. And my obsession is... Uh, 
you know, to explore the meanings of the world and words. And uh, I, I heard here different uh, expressions like ideology or religion, um, etc. And uh, so I, I try to um, to focus on on these uh, meanings of uh, of these words. But um, I I start uh, with a personal uh, remark uh, as as other speaker uh, speakers here. Um, uh, so il 11 years ago, um, before I read uh, Robert Nelson um, book, uh, I had analyzed in my article "Apostle of uh, Freedom in the New World" a speech of our former president and economist Václav Klaus. Perhaps you remember him. <laughs> uh, held, uh, the speech was held in, uh, in the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center in w Washington. Uh, and at the same time, I was dealing with, um, with the Christian dogmatic controversies uh, of the f uh, 4th century. Uh, so I was surprised by the similarity uh, between confessions uh, of the church councils at the time uh, and uh, Klaus's speeches. Uh, it was conspicuous that uh, the former president uh, didn't argue, uh, argue rationally at all, but his speech, um, even in his former structure, it, its former structure, had the, the obvious character of religious confession with the articles of belief uh, introduced with formal we believe, uh, etc. And uh, of course, uh, the condemnation of heretics. Yes, yes. Yes, uh, it was very interesting uh, for me, this, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, not only for this reason, uh, my attention was drawn by uh, Robert Nelson's thesis about economics as religion, and uh, I, I agree uh, with his analysis in, in many respects. But despite this uh, mutual convergence, uh, of course I'm not so important as uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Robert Nelson, uh, I prefer another terminology of uh, describing the same phenomenon, which Nelson brilliantly analyzed. Uh, in my opinion, um, the definition of religion as, uh, for example, I, I quote from, uh, from the book of uh, Nelson, an individual's ultimate concern to which all other concerns are subordinated, which Robert Nelson himself quotes <laughs> from, from another source, is too broad for me. Uh, also, the identification of uh, God with, uh, I quote um, again, one's uh, ultimate value is too extensive. The same phenomenon can be better described as a basic, uh, basic outlook um, on the world or preferences of values. Uh, values, uh, which are expressions uh, that uh, Robert Nelson uh, um, expresses uh, too in, in his book. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we all have an outlook uh, on the world or preferences of values, uh, either religious or secular. But uh, every basic outlook uh, on the world may easily be perverted to an ideology or fundamentalism. Um, it is obvious that uh, an ideology or fundamentalism can be dual, as well uh, as a basic outlook, um, outlook on the world can be dual. Uh, it means uh, uh, religious or secular. Uh, in effect, in the modern economics, uh, we have uh, more to do with the uh, secular ideology or fundamentalism uh, rather than with the religious one. In my view, um, the thesis about economics as religion is uh, not fair to religion. Um, as a Christian, I am even convinced that the ideology or fundamentalism is direct opposite to faith in its uh, genuine sense. For faith, uh, at least in the New Testament, means a human attitude or virtue which liberates us while ideology or fundamentalism makes slaves of us. This is a big difference. But Robert Nelson uh, names religion is in the Bible actually denounced as idolatry. Uh, therefore, I would rather speak about economics as an idolatry 
or ideology or fundamentalism than as a religion. Uh, what does idolatry uh, exactly mean in our context, in this context? Generally speaking, idolatry is a term for the worship of an idol or an object which was created by humans themselves. And human beings have this strange ability to create monsters which they subsequently worship, which they fear, and whose slaves they make themselves of. These monsters are not uh, only physical objects, such as uh, figures or of deities or technical inventions, but also non-physical entities as uh, human uh, institutions or ideas. What does it have to do with economics? Uh, indeed, the scientists, including economists, are similar to house builders who construct their scientific system like a building whose, uh, whose uh, cornerstones are some general basic ideas. The trouble is that um, this set of basic ideas can't be controlled by the method of special science itself, but only by uh, philosophical inquiry, I'm afraid, <laughs> or this. Uh, if, I, uh, if an economist or scientist in general is not ready to overstep the limited uh, framework of his domain, these ideas are falsely considered self-evident um, and are simply supposed by him, but not questioned. Consequently, a lot of economists, even excellent specialists, have only reduced knowledge of essential ideas or presuppositions that define their basic outlook on the world, including uh, concepts uh, of the human nat nat nature, of the uh, human society, of the freedom, of the preferences of values, of the political systems uh, and systems of law. Uh, this uh, doesn't uh, have to be a great problem if economists uh, remain concerned with their special area or segment of reality. But it can pose uh, a serious problem if they are concerned with politics and have the ambition to organize the society according uh, to their models. Thinking that their very idea, uh, area is society or universe as a whole. Uh, it can pose very serious problems if they unconsciously elevate their limited models of reality to the ultimate understanding of the world. And if they insist strongly on their outlook on the world as on the only true one, without having, um, um, having uh, control, uh, having these ideas under control. Under this uh, constellation, the monsters are born and uh, in the form of economic idolatry or ideology or fundamentalism uh, emerges. And this is my, uh, my idea about the difference between uh, outlook uh, uh, on the world uh, and ideology and uh, religion. I think uh, these, uh, um, these expressions uh, mean something else. In fact, uh, today's economists are very often advocates of such implicit outlook on the world. But who are the monsters uh, that present the objects of worship uh, in modern uh, idolatry? Some of them uh, was, um, named, were named here in the discussion and are precisely identified and uh, analyzed uh, in Robert Nelson's book economics as a religion. It is, for example, the idea of the pursuit of self-interest as a motive force of well-functioning economy, which produces uh, common good and it's, uh, as its uh, unintended effect. It is a concept of unceasing growth as an ultimate goal of development of human society, etc. What I find most significant in, is Robert Nelson's argument that uh, in uh, this outlook on the world, economic values are 
favored over others without any explicit justification. These values uh, or their preferences are supposed uh, as given or natural. Therefore, this economic outlook on the world suggests uh, the illusion that the pursuit of the economic values is the authentic and sufficient goal of the human life, as was said in the discussion. This illusion, which implies the presupposition uh, that other and especially higher values are elusive, is tempting, uh, it's very tempting and catching. Uh, why it is so tempting and catching? I think uh, this uh, seductiveness is uh, potentiated by the fact that the economic models work. Uh, what is so fascinating about modern economics is exactly that it, under certain conditions and to a certain measure, works. Uh, without uh, any doubt, modern economics helped to solve social problems better than anything else. It is clear that society benefits from well-functioning markets. But it does not mean that the economic outlook on the world does work as a program for a human life, or for, for a human society as such. Consequently, if we idolize these monsters, these ideas, that are involved in this economical outlook on the world, we can be led astray both as individuals and as society. And I think this is the, the biggest risk of, of this outlook on the world. But uh, we all tend to idolize them, uh, these monsters, because we inhale them like, like an air in our society. And this suggestive, uh, suggestive impact on, of economics ideology uh, extingu um, extinguishes basic critical questions about the legitimacy uh, of the monsters. We are like uh, bewitched uh, by ideological cliches which dominate the modern society. I think in, in this situation, what we need in this situation and what is solution uh, I don't know exactly, so I have no project uh, to change this, uh, uh, this situation. But uh, what we need is more uh, fortitude to ask basic philosophical questions about uh, cornerstones of economical theories. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think also more faith, well, more faith in the genuine sense of the world, uh, to be open to new ideas and new alternatives. And we need also more economists, such uh, as Robert Nelson is, uh, who, who is capable to do it. <laughs> so it's everything what I Thank you. wanted Thank to say. Thank you very much. This, this will be uh, short. Thank you for all your comments, and I agree. Uh, uh, I'm afraid I am in German school. So with, uh, you know, I, I uh, obviously <laughs> I agree with the overall. I just wanted to address the, the uh, one question which you raised, which is, uh, has been often raised in discussions of this book and so forth, which is whether the use of the term religion is legitimate. And so I would say, well, for example, um, even among relatively mainstream schools, scholars of economic thought, it's increasingly being discussed that when Adam Smith says the invisible hand, what he really means is God. And this is appearing in scholarly journals and so forth with some regularity now in the last 10 years. And so if the invisible hand is God, it seems to me that uh, a theory which is based on the invisible hand is a religion. <laughs> I mean, we might as well call it that. <laughs> if it's basically about a God only thinly disguised. <laughs> and uh, the, other, the idea that you were suggesting uh, that, well, a real religion wouldn't be a form of idolatry. I mean, I think the term religion needs to be used more broadly, which is that it's all of these beliefs and you can't disqualify something as a religion just because you think it's bad. <laughs> or it's false. 
Uh, you know, the study of religion is about religion in its good parts and its bad parts. And uh, some religions, like National Socialism, which I would have called a religion, were abominable. But it was still a religion, from my point of view. <laughs> and, uh, but I'll, the other thing that I will say is something that uh, maybe as an American, uh, but I think it applies to Europe too, whether you call something a religion has a, some very practical political consequences that are not theoretical. Uh, in the United States, if you call it a religion, then it has to be separated from the state. And the, uh, by, by the American prin principle of separation of church and state. But I think here in Europe, too, there's a strong impulse to say that the government and the state should not be grounded in religion. Uh, but if, but it, what that means, though, in the United States is that what we've been talking about tonight these secular religions that are not, that you don't want to call a religion, those religions are authorized in the United States to fully employ all the powers of the American state to implement their, what I would call their religion. And whereas if you take Christian religion, it's completely prohibited from, you can express your views as a Christian, but you can't implement Christianity through the powers of the state. And so this means that, for example, an example I give is that uh, um, in the United States, in the elementary schools, environmentalism, which I would say is full of religious values, it really is a religion, environmentalism is taught in elementary school. And literally as a religion from my point of view, but if you tried to do the same thing to teach a Christian religion, uh, it would be immediately prohibited. <laughs> and so what I see is that this question of what's religion and not has an immense practical political significance in terms of wielding power. And the, and the attitudes that you're taking actually are counterproductive to your own interests. What they say is, oh, it's okay to wield power in the name of something that's not religion, <laughs> which is a secular ideology, but it then would be impossible to wield power in the name of something that you would explicitly call a religion, such as Christianity. And anyway, that's all I have to say. Okay, well, thank you. And I think this is a good point to give the word to, to uh, a, a person who studied religions. Yes, being young business. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, uh, will you read or will it be better than you? Yeah, okay. So, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. I was preparing for that. <laughs> Final moment. <laughs> so I think, uh, of course, it depends on the definition of religion. And, uh, but uh, I, I think uh, there, are, there are good reasons to, uh, to differentiate it. Because... Uh, the secular religion is a contradiction adicto for me, so it's a, it's a very problematic, uh, problematic concept or a very problematic expression, and and I don't believe, oh, believe, uh, I don't think that. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, Just that, mark how, uh, how, how we can substitute the word think and believe in common language almost on a daily basis. Um, Just a small, small little note here. T thank you. Um, it's a lot <laughs> to say yeah, this yeah, word. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I, uh, I think that uh, the national so socialism or communism is not a religion. It's a su substitution of religion, but not uh, really a religion. Oh, I, I think if we understand uh, the religion in, in this uh, really broad sense, so we, um, uh, we, we undermine the, uh, the distinctions between, uh, between the, uh, this, uh, this phenomenon. And... Um, yeah. So uh, I think uh, my my answer is that uh, there, there are uh, there are uh, very good reason to to decide uh, to uh, discern it to to make this distinction between between the both. So it means Perfect. ideology or Perfect. religion. So uh, can we call economics a religion? Or if you want to enlighten us on the difference between ideology and religion, 
go ahead. You can see being the youngest has the benefit of having the last word. So all the young, younger, and especially the youngest in the world, being black or white or whatever, uh, there is your chance. Uh, so. Um, uh, I'm glad you, I'm actually not glad you mentioned our former president Klaus, but just to, uh, you know, uh, uh, say something that I'm proud of myself. Uh, the, the most proud of moment was when I refused to publish with the president at the age of 24, because I didn't want to let down my academic career, because he basically quotes uh, three internet sources at the end of his book, and they're usually internet sources, uh, some of the Wikipedia. Nonetheless, um, <laughs> when I was young and beautiful, uh, I, I used to go uh, and Yizhny Miesto, which is something like Brooklyn and in New York, horrible place. Uh, to this little hill, uh, it's communist Bronx. Plenty of houses and people smashed into concrete blocks. And uh, when I was young and beautiful, I used to go every now and then to this little hill that is now destroyed by some developers uh, close to the Metro Obatov. And I used to ponder and think about, uh, you know, the universe and everything. And I always wondered what are the connections between things, like what what are we doing here, of course, and how does it connect to everything. So that's the backbone of basically myself. And all I've been trying was as uh, these gentlemen and uh, women, of course, around the world. Uh, is to try out, uh, to find out why the heck are we here and how does things one thing relate to the other and uh, That's just to explain why I study different strange subjects that don't go much together Be it uh, religion or Jewish studies or international relations European studies and so on and so forth for me there is uh, not much difference between uh, the areas and the subjects. And I actually, myself, I'm an entrepreneur for four years, so I did the business, so I also try to uh, be less philosophical and look at it from the money point of view. Now, uh, you were talking about religion, and we were trying, we're trying to define what religion is. Uh, it is an endless debate because, guess what? Religion does not have a definition that everybody agrees on. It is, um, it is you, you can read all theories, but it was strange to study uh, religion uh, at the Faculty of Arts for me, or religious studies, and we basically didn't know what are we studying. It's not defined, so study something that you don't know what it actually is. Uh, <laughs> but it's an interesting thing. Uh, religion uh, comes from the Latin word, uh, or there are two possible uh, origins, uh, religare or religere, and they both mean to tie back, to bring back, uh, which uh, perhaps by the means of rituals, people try to come back, uh, get into touch with something that they think they should get into touch with here and again. Uh, something that gave him uh, basic knowledge of what is good and evil, what is good, what is bad. Uh, for some, it were, they were basically uh, social norms that they tried to you know, tell people what to do and what not to do. And on top of that, there was some god or gods or deities that were going, basically guarantors of the moral order. Uh, they were the ones who gave meaning to what is good and what is bad. And that is something that I uh, lack. Uh, when I looked at uh, the history of e economics and basically uh, science, what, what struck me was that uh, as we got God out of the picture, famously Nietzsche said, we are the ones that, that killed God. We got him away from the earth, from the sky. He doesn't live in the clouds, so where is he now? Uh, there was a vacuum, a uh, vacuum as, uh, as, as Mr. Nelson said, a vacu uh, vacuum that uh, some said was actually good, be it Comte or James Fraser. Um, religion was just a matter of controlling things. Now we can control nature. We don't have to pray to, uh, to God to control the nature. We can do it directly or con we can do it better than God. Basically, we can orchestrate uh, and make the world a better place without any uh, uh, God. Uh, and, um, but, and then we have the different theories. Uh, Bentham tying on uh, onto him, uh, John Stuart Mill, trying to find what is uh, how to define good and evil in terms of happiness, utility, and, and suffering, um, and, and we try to find out the, um, uh, what is good and what is bad without the guarantor, without the, the one that basically gives it meaning. And that's something that strikes me in the sense um, uh, we um, kind of agreed or uh, Bentham and then Stuart believe that uh, suffering is bad, uh, happiness is good. But, of course, trouble with happiness is how to define happiness. Trouble with suffering is, is suffering actually trouble? Uh, uh, does suffering have meaning? Uh, or is it something we have to get rid of? And we don't even know why. Let's just get rid of suffering. I understand when people die and there is pain, suffering is bad. But overall, in our lives, we all had some bad moments. And uh, I guess it's hard to say they were meaningless. Uh, and. Uh, 
So in, in this regard, I agree with um, Mr. Nelson that um, um, uh, our current problem is religious, and in the sense, uh, in the sense, uh, it touches directly in, into the meaning. What is the meaning of this? Uh, uh, what is the meaning of progress? Uh, if we try to bring heaven on earth, why should we try to do that? Oh my God! Has anyone wondered? Is, you know, why should we try to even do this crazy thing that is basically impossible? Uh, so. Um, uh, that's something that got out of the picture, the meaning, and, and that's why it, it touches in all different areas, uh, it, whether we like it or not. Uh, we all went to Harry Potter, or I didn't, but you know, people do. Uh, you wanted to. But uh, what else? Uh, Lords of the Rings, all these movies, they bring Matrix, they bring spirituality back, and in a way, uh, they do interest us because it touches on our basic uh, question, why are we here, what are we doing, what should we be doing? So it's a backbone of all uh, basic activities. So I, uh, it's not a philosophical problem. It's basically a, a ground zero uh, uh, question to solve for me, uh, not just to ponder it or consider it to be a distant philosophical problem. Another thing that I want to mention, and that's the, the, the final point, is so, uh, 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 besides this fear of suffering, and we kind of just bring it down and we don't have guarantor for the meaning of it, is uh, we tend to be locked in our rationality. Uh, I mean, even our, the table down here is basically rational uh, construct that you'd never see in nature. Uh, uh, it reminds me of Monty Python's uh, fame, uh, meaning of life, no, sorry, um, uh, Life of Brian, uh, famous uh, uh, scene where uh, Brian shouts to all these people that want to uh, worship him, think as individuals, and they, they all shout, we are individuals, we think as individuals, and they all say it together, of course, we think <laughs> as individuals. So the question is, if we don't think about these things and good and evil and uh, different economic theories and other theories from this perspective of uh, using only our rationality and basically trying to find a better rational explanation of, of something that maybe is not all that rational. Uh, and I'm not saying that science is bad, that this attempt to define things and understand them is bad by itself, but uh, I'm afraid sometimes uh, at the bottom of it, there could be this fear of chaos. In the sense, we want to know, we want to be certain, we, we, we don't want to uh, uh, be just smashed by meteorites the next day. We don't want to wake up uh, turning into something else like Kafka uh, wrote, right? Uh, it is this fear uh, that we try to overcome with rationality. And um, my thought is maybe chaos and irrationality is not bad. Maybe we should accept it. Maybe we should even consider it as part of the theory-making process. Um, um, countries, nations before us, ancient ones, uh, such as people in Mesopotamia, every year there was New Year. What did they do? They did the same thing like we do, which is what? We get drunk, okay? Uh, we don't, of course, but you know, other people get drunk. Uh, uh, and, and then again, the next day, they, they, were not, uh, they, they were sober. They wanted the law again to function. They, want, they, they uh, knew that the sovereign has to be the sovereign, and they have to accept their position. Rationality and system, r rule of law has, has got some point. And even when they uh, uh, made some decision making, which I read, and I'm not sure it was true, but in Mesopotamia, once there was some uh, big decisions such as should we respond to this attack by attack or should we just you know, uh, try to uh, prefer diplomacy before war, they would make uh, the decision two times. Once, when they were sober, rational, let's look at the arguments. The second one, again, surprisingly, they got drunk. And then they uh, answered it from the drunk point of view. Like, you know, uh, and if the points were both the same, then they just did it. So if rationally they should attack, then they got drunk and they said, yeah, let's kill them. You know, let's, I don't like them anyway. Then they go and wage the war. If uh, it's different in one state of the mind, then they try to wage it uh, more in depth. So um, uh, where it leads to is this thought, maybe we should, uh, with this attempt to um, get rid of chaos and try to grasp things rationally, we should maybe always hold this mystic or whatever belief in the unknown or something that is ungraspable, something that cannot be defined. Uh, and it doesn't have to be something higher or transcendent, but it's an element th that I would call humility towards everything. Uh, and um, it's close to Levinas the other, but it's basically uh, uh, knowing that we are not the last uh, who, who decides and who knows. That's yes. So thank you very much. Now we are, thank you.
Any re reaction? Yeah, well, or, or actually, it's, it's, uh, it will be quick. Okay. <laughs> but uh, it's a confession, uh, sort of, so to speak. Um, I agree uh, pretty much with, uh, I might not use exactly all the words, but essentially agree with what you said. And uh, so uh, my latest project, uh, to think about the question uh, that you're talking about, um, I think best by writing. Uh, it's kind of the way I organize. So I decided to write a book about the question of whether God exists. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the, because that's really what you're asking. I mean, uh, and it's, un it's extremely uncomfortable for our contemporary secular society to ask a question like that. Uh, it's not uh, hard if you're already <laughs> convinced, but if you're a social scientist. So uh, anyway, I have now finished a first draft, and uh, I'm having trouble finding a publisher, unfortunately. <laughs> Well, okay, so the title is, the title is God, parenthesis, very probably, in parenthesis, exists. Uh, a social scientist gives five rational reasons for the existence of a God. <laughs> so it's not necessarily exactly the Christian God, but... Yeah, I mean, first of all, one conclusion which I started with, which is it's not a matter of proof. Basically, it's a question that goes outside the scientific method. You should start from that to begin with. Uh, and uh, if you assume it's a scientific question, you'll automatically say God does not exist. <laughs> and because uh, there's no hypothesis that can be confirmed in a, using the scientific method. Um, but then anyway, anyway, if you go on, I basically concluded that there are a number of things about human existence that don't conform to anything that's scientifically explicable. <laughs> and uh, if that's true, then it involves some element of the supernatural. And so if it does involve the supernatural, that's another way Richard Dawkins defines God <laughs> as that which is supernatural. And he says God does not exist. So my conclusion is diametrically opposed to Richard Dawkins. Now, I've run into the concern uh, from some Christians. A few people have read this book so far in manuscript. Uh, that the God that I'm talking about is rather vague and abstract and rather far removed from the Christian God of the Bible or of the church and so forth, and that's clearly true. Um, but my response, though, is to say, look, uh, if the future is really in the hands of religion, we got to start somewhere, <laughs> and it's a big place, because I'm basically a secular person by my own personal history, uh, and uh, but so it's a big leap for me <laughs> to make. I only reached this leap in the last three or four years uh, to say that there's something supernatural. So therefore, there's some kind of God out there, but I don't know much more than that. But that's still a big deal. <laughs> that's all that can be said. I guess. <laughs> okay. I'm interested by which met method. By which method uh, did Richard Dawkins find out that God does not exist? His study of biology, et cetera, et cetera. He has a book called The God Delusion. So with existing scientific methods? With well, existing. he claims it's science. It okay, but let's go back from theology to economics, which I don't think is that, that, that big of a distance. Yeah. No, they're Nevertheless, the same, they're the same thing. The same, same distance. Now, we do have actually actual real theologians here uh, in the room. Uh, and we have also, as I said, philosophers, we have economists, bankers. We have uh, a lot of younger people than yourself. And uh, so, it, the floor is yours. Questions, comments, of course, most welcomed are critical questions. Yes. So if you can just wait for the microphone to, to reach you. Um, the microphone to reach you. Yes, it's coming. Thank you. Sorry for that. What could 
we are coming good in a developed economy, as we are. To my opinion, it can be art and culture, or better, the culture of art. If you consider the period from about 1800, when money became more and more abstract, means paper money, when paper money was created, and then when paper money lost the contact to the metal, yeah, to the concrete. Yeah. And this went on and on and on, decade by decade. And you will see that during the, these 1800 days, art decreased. Yeah. Art decreased, and, and the production of art decreased uh, related to the GDP. So the GDP went up. The monetary wealth of society went up, but the, the, the quality of art went down. Yeah? Went down, yeah. And you have a wonderful example just here uh, in front of you. It is uh, uh, the Church of uh, Maria Sata Maria Snitschka. Is it like this? Yeah. Okay. And so, for the ones who have been inside, go and look. And this is a wonderful example of how um, previous societies, which were less, much less monetarized than ours, mm -hmm. uh, used their excess wealth, and the excess wealth was transformed into art, and we can see it still nowadays in these works. Okay. And the, 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 so the final thought yeah, is, it is not art for the art, art for art, but it is the art which leads us to the question of human transcendence. Yeah? So, the art leads us to God. And this is for developed countries, means when, when the belly is full, yeah? when the belly is full, then the, the only subject matter, yeah? which can be, is, um, is uh, art, yeah? and art as a medium to reach uh, some idea of God. Okay, okay, thank you for that. Do we, have, do we have other comments, questions? I will gather a few and then you can choose on which you want to build or respond. Yes, please. Monica. religion and economy <laughs> in, the, uh, in the body of the uh, basic Czech language is a very old, old word. Yeah. Also, yeah. <laughs> also another etymological connection is, uh, is hospodin, ho hospodářství a hospoda. This connection about breath and spirit in yoga, but it is very natural for us Slavs because these are like very uh, similar two words, duch and dech, which is like duch is spirit and dech is breath. I will learn Czech this evening. <laughs> So, is there anything coming up 
isn't that just wishful thinking that you want it to be so? And uh, second question to Christian. Um, again, it's you said as a matter of fact, but it's quite a bold statement to say that there is no such thing as the invisible hand, which you said. But it, it is a bold statement because it's like the gentleman who's whose name I don't remember, the psychologist, psychiatrist, points out. Uh, he's he his job is he makes money and yet he helps people. So it's, it's, it's as simple as that. It's, it's a very simple concept, the invisible hand. So he does that to make money, it's a selfish reasons, and yet the result is helping people, helping the common good. So it's invisible hand, it's a very simple concept. So how can you, so the argument seems to be setting as a premise everything you are against. But this is too easy, isn't it? To just say it as a premise. But so everything you argue against, you, you just you just start from saying it, it's wrong, and then you go on. But just, can you justify it a bit more? Thank you. Well, thank you for an exemplary question for both guests. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I, I I don't want it to be actually as I was saying. I'm kind of nervous. <laughs> There's something comforting about having a firm religion. Uh, Christianity was the rock of medieval society. Uh, it might have been a mythical belief, at least it looks that way to a lot of people now, but it still was the core of, you know, of the world. And, and, and I, so I, I think that uh, what we could call belief in economic progress, rationality, a lot of these ideas, um, has been quite reassuring, even to me in my <laughs> earlier days. And uh, although, unfortunately, with the problem it was for me that was when I actually looked at it closely, I found that it was reassuring to believe, <laughs> but it didn't hold up very well <laughs> to you know close scrutiny and rational inquiry. So it was comforting, but I couldn't justify it. So I was like a medieval priest who all of a sudden was wondering about whether God exists, <laughs> which was not a comforting question. It was actually a frightening question. And uh, so I would say, though, that, uh, it, I mean, in a broader sense, what I'm talking about, although I don't like these jargony terms, but it, another way, which is, other people put it, which is more conventional, is to say that modern assumptions are fading and that we are basically entering into a postmodern era. We've already started entering it into a, a few decades ago. And the certainties of economic progress and rationality and other things that are, you know, pushed into you in economics graduate school that on a broad basis across all of society they're being challenged. And so it's not only economics, although that's a particularly important example. Um, and uh, so, uh, but I, I would say that ultimately uh, the proof is in the pudding and economics as the salvation of the world failed. It didn't save, <laughs> save the world. In fact, it provided us with technical means for being gruesomely <laughs> efficient at doing horrible things in some cases. <laughs> and, uh, and the other thing that, about it is that it failed in its pretensions to be, a, you know, to provide a scientific basis for the management of society. Because that's what it was really trying to do. Uh, and economists kept hoping there would be a Newton of economics, but we haven't even remotely come anywhere near anybody like a Newton of economics. And in fact, what it seems to be the case is that understanding of the society is simply not a question which is amenable to the kind of models and formal methods and at least of the physical sciences and not really even of the you know, biological sciences either. And so, uh, and so this, it's basically kind of a bankrupt scholasticism, which is living on now of its own <laughs> momentum, just like uh, bankrupt scholasticism lasted a long time in the, you know, later Middle Ages. Yep. Thank you. To that question. Yeah. Um, what? And then there was this question of art, whether maybe, yes. whether the next religion will be art. Okay. The, yeah. I, or... Or no? Well, what is oh, the common good? I'll give a quick answer. 
what, what is the common good in a modern society and Let, is, uh, what is art an instrument for? Maybe I, I would make to make so, a second short comment on that, but you start to... I, I'm, this is going to be real brief. The most important piece of artwork of the last <laughs> hundred years was the U.S. mission to the moon. <laughs> <laughs> it was brief. Which had very little or almost no practical purpose, <laughs> but had immense symbolic purpose. And, you know, the sense of it as a cathedral of our time is, uh, you know, kind of, I mean, in terms of the ability to express the values of belief in science and modernity and everything. But, but I think it was really practical because one, um, one of the greatest artists that we had in the last century was inspired to create Moonwalk, you know, after that. So. <laughs> well, I... That's not an unknown in I, yeah, I pick up this string later on, uh, on yeah. but on a different approach. First, I start with, um, uh, with your question. Uh, what do I mean when I say that uh, the invisible hand do does not exist? Uh, I mean precisely uh, that what Adam Smith is writing, that there is an automatic mechanism from um, private initiative, uh, free markets, uh, um, and um, yeah, private companies to the common good through the mechanism of the invisible hand, which uh, we can call market forces, or we can call it a divine intention. Uh, if you follow, and I, I've read a l dozens of um, uh, philosophers and, uh, and theo uh, theologists who all said the same, that Adam Smith was really talking about a, a God's hand. Uh, so, um, but... Even if we, say, if we consider that it's just the market forces, um, then uh, I think this, um, this hypothesis from Adam Smith is wrong because it, uh, um, it might be true, or it, sorry, it can be true, and it can uh, in the same way not be true. And there are very clear examples for that. So um, private companies uh, can contribute to the common good in all meanings. That's what I tried to, to, to say first. They create... Um, jobs which have a meaning, which are secure, they don't harm the environment, um, they contribute to democracy, and they make everything better. This is a possibility, and there are lots of um, examples for that possibility. But we have also examples of the exact opposite. I, I'm repeating myself now. Uh, and we have even evidence on a, on, on a macroeconomic level. For instance, in the US, uh, peop the average people earn less than 20 years before, although market forces have been, um, uh, have been enforced. Uh, environment is uh, worse off, democracy is undermined, um, and people are less happy, statistically proven. So uh, what I want to say, there is no proof uh, that what Smith uh, assumed is true, and that's why um, more famous um, um, economic um, ethical thinkers like uh, Peter Ulrich from, from Switzerland, St. Gallen, he's talking, uh, he created a term which is the Marktmetaphysische Gemeinwohlfiktion, which is the, uh, the, 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 the metaphysical, metaphysical common good fiction of free markets. Um, just to embed my thoughts. And what, what do I want to say? Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I want to say... Uh, that actually went well with you. <laughs> yeah. Now you should have the main point. Now the message comes, exactly. <laughs> now the message comes. Uh, I would like to find a mechanism uh, that makes for sure that what Smith was hoping only, huh? so that uh, economic freedom, private companies, um, uh, for sure lead to the common good. And this means we have to create something intentionally. And uh, the economy for the common good is such an intent. Um, and the economy for the common good is a market economy. Uh, yeah, Václav was talking about well-working markets. Huh? Um, w markets are not defined either. <laughs> markets are just uh, a space of encounter of persons with uh, economic <coughs> intentions and activities. But how we shape markets, that is totally free. And so it's, uh, it's already bold, I would give back, it's bold to, to make any assumption on markets if you do not define markets before. 
And then I would say uh, markets, as we, ex as we experience them nowadays, they can fail more than they um, uh, create a common good. But this is not a saying against markets and against the market forces, but it's an invitation to think about how we would like to shape markets. Yeah. And the economy for the common good uh, is, is a market economy, but with two major differences. It's a fully ethical market economy, which means that all companies have to really prove what they do on justice, what they do on solidarity, what they do on democracy, what they do on sustainability, and what they do on human dignity. And why these five values? Because these five values are the most important constitutional values in democracies. And second, uh, economy for the common good is a truly liberal market economy, which means by definition, not what we um, usually understand by a liberal market economy, because we, we, uh, we mix it up with a capitalistic market economy, but I mean by definition with a liberal market economy that all participants of the market really have the same freedoms, the same rights, and the same opportunities. And if these conditions are fulfilled, that we all have the same um, conditions when we um, participate in the markets, and uh, when we do not only enjoy economic freedoms, but also have to prove what we do on the other constitutional values of our democratic societies, sustainability, justice, solidarity, democracy, human dignity, then uh, Marxists will, will, will not be perfect either, but they will more probably uh, provide for the common good than uh, that markets that we have known so far. If I may add a small little thought, I was actually thinking about this invisible hand of the markets, and to me, rather than it being a theory or even a hypothesis, if you look at it from this perspective, it's a prayer. We hope and we wish that our individual careless, let's say, profit-seeking or utility-maximizing behavior will somehow, by this invisible hand, be turned into common good. That's uh, something that can be done, here I absolutely agree, if the conditions are, are set in, in a way. I had this thought when I was reading uh, the letter to Romans in, 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 in the New Testament, where you have the reverse of the invisible hand of the market. I want to do good, but, oh my God, I end up doing evil. Whereas the invisible hand is exactly the opposite. I want to do evil, I want to be egoist, I don't want to care, but damn it, I did it again. I contributed to, to common good, you know. Just point of uh, feedback, or not criticism, but just uh, feedback on, on Christian. I, uh, I like the idea of common good, and it's nice to you know, have some progress and be nicer together you know, for the world. But uh, number one, like competition. Um, uh, some people uh, are more motivated by competition than cooperation. I mean, there are different types of people. Uh, for some, Especially it is for some and older and fathers and mothers. Uh, competition is uh, is you know, motivating, and it is hard to say that it is totally negative. Uh, I was in South Korea, brutal competition to uh, live up to Japan and surpass it, and it motivates them and does they do great things. Uh, so, um, just one point. Second. Um, if we prefer, you know, common good versus our own profit making, because I think there is some thought you uh, uh, give more money or attention to the others versus to yourself, that is all nice and I would love it. But the question is, uh, if the others do not play the same game, they basically uh, make you, you know, go bankrupt or you end up in servitude. If we would all, uh, my fear is, be nice to uh, uh, the others, have uh, projects to have common good, then you have Chinese other companies brutally going for the profit, dominating more and more, uh, then they will take over our nice common good, you know, gardens and, and all this and we'll be still doing common good, but they'll be actually the ones that pay us money and we'll be just uh, um, under them and in a, a, a lesser role. So the uh, kind of uh, feedback, or I'm trying to f also think how to do it, but uh, the question is how to create this common good. Of course, there are uh, uh, um, cases when it interlaps, when helping the common good helps us yourself, uh, and vice versa. A uh, perfect example, I was writing this work on Marshall Plan. It helped the US economy, finance, uh, security. At the same time, it helped us in Europe, and it had both aspects, but it doesn't always happen. 
uh, not always can you combine common good with your own good. And if all the others do not want to do common good, they just do their own good, then you end up doing the common good for yourself and the others may, might take advantage of you. Which is a basic kind of a, like a difficulty with this is that we would have to change our thinking and the players would have to accept this notion, assumption that common good is good. And then I think it would work. But um, my fear is how can we achieve this without being the losers? I think now the question has, has been arisen. Yeah many times. Okay. What? Look, I have a quick comment. <laughs> uh, I think that, uh, that when you, you know, it, w the idea of the invisible hand, when it's formalized by economists, it's just a model of perfect competition and so forth, which leads to perfect efficiency and maximum social uh, gain. And, but anyway, this is just purely a conceptual model. It has n very little relationship to what exists out there in the world, I anywhere in Europe or the United States in the 20th century. And in fact, you know, what, w one way of talking about the welfare state, which is the actual economic system of the European Union, is that it's the pursuit of the common good. <laughs> and uh, so it's all, we already have the pursuit of the common good. But it also turns out to be extremely difficult to identify the details of what that means as, as we see in, you know, in our current debates about what the appropriate character of the welfare state in Europe should be. I think that's the question. Uh, what, what is the common good? And of course there are intuitions and we share a lot of basic values and objectives, uh, and we are creating indicators. There is the Better Life Index from the OECD countries, there is the Gross National Happiness in the tiny state of Bhutan, and uh, the movement of the economy for the common good says, well, uh, we might be inspired by scientists, we might be inspired by philosophies and uh, even spiritual traditions, but in a democratic society, we should define by ourselves what we understand by the common good. And the proposal is that we gather in our communities where we live, in Prague, in, 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 in Brünn, in, in Vienna and in Salzburg, and we define the maybe 20 most important ingredients of life quality, of general welfare, of common good. And uh, the common good product, uh, which is the, the success indicator of a national economy, is measured once a year. And it's not only art. Art is important, but it's just one ingredient of the common good in an in a already um, um, society of high living standard. And we know from, uh, from psychology and also from uh, research of happiness, now it's a, a more contemporary scientific discipline, that uh, the most important ingredients of the common good is fulfilling relationships. Huh? And uh, competition is destroying relationships. Okay, I, I, can, uh, I will enter a, 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 competition, a competitive battle with you after, uh, to, on, on this issue because it's my, my passion. Um, a fulfilling relationship even to, to God, is, uh, which is not called religion but spirituality. Education, health, uh, participation, democratic participation, welfare of time. Huh? These are indicators that people in, in the whole world say this is what I understand by the common good. And uh, I don't care if the GDP goes up or down. I care if I have a secure income, if I can meet my basic needs, if I'm healthy, if I have time to do what I would like to do, if I, ha if I have my, beer, my dear beloved, and if nature is stable and I don't have, I'm full of fears um, according to the environment. And this is what we can measure very, uh, very clearly once a year. And, uh, and the proposal is, um, develop um, welfare indicators or common good indicators uh, that substitute the GDP as a success indicator. And of course, we can continue to measure the monetary aggregates, but we will not learn out of the monetary aggregates if you are in peace or in war, if you are in democracy or dictatorship, if you meet our basic needs or if, or if you are hungry, and if our relationships are working well or not. Um, just one comment on the, on the competition case. Uh, first, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a question of definition. And uh, what, what I'm uh, trying to, uh, to propose, uh, that we should not enhance competition, which is actually what we're doing, which is the opposite of what competition in Latin means. 
because competition in Latin means cum petere, to search together. And uh, this is what I, what I would support. We should search together in the economy as free entrepreneurs for solutions to satisfy our needs. That's exactly what economy should be about and what would create a uh, common good. But what companies are doing, they, uh, they search against each other for solutions for the common good. And this, in literal Latin, would be counterpetition. And the definition of counterpetition uh, is uh, that our successes exclude each other, that either you win or I win. And I think this should not be our motive. Huh? It might be a side effect, and then there's nothing bad about it. But it should not be the approach and the motive. I want to win. Because in a conversation, if I want to win, then if you say something that is more enlightened than what I was thinking so far, then I would, by, by principle, put it down and try to, uh, to, to, ha to get the effect that what I'm saying is more brilliant. But if I'm, if I'm in a co cooperative approach, then I will listen very deeply to you, and whatever you say that is more enlightened to me, I will integrate it in my proposal. And through this, uh, I think we all agree that we would uh, get a better result. And that's the proposal to have the markets. Free companies, private company, private company, but not enhance uh, counterpetition up to ex its extremes. Even cannibalism uh, is, is not punished uh, and penalized in the economy, but it leads to major success. In a private relationship, cannibalism is one of the capital sins, and we go to jail immediately, and I think that's good. In economy, cannibalism, one of the extremes of, of counterpetition, leads to economic success. And the whole proposal is not to abolish competition, competition so um, I think I agree, in the, in the, but, uh, but to penalize the most aggressive um, behaviors of uh, being against each other and to enhance uh, types of cooperation between free and individual companies. Well, uh, just very small. This can happen between Google and Cessna because they don't want to destroy each other. But I mean, realistically, if you have two companies, one person they fight against, one of the company dies, and it is either or. It is no, let's let's work together as companies and this. But I mean, just saying that uh, it is in a way a brutal battle sometimes, and it cannot be avoided. What, what, are, the conclusions? what, are, what are the conclusions? out? Of course, I agree that this is happening, and some say that's good. And some management literature book says that the goal of you is to kill your competitors, your counterpetitors. No? And I said, I think this is not a, a very humane and a very reasonable approach. I, I would say the goal is to try to cooperate with your co-companies. And if you don't manage to do it in the end and one dies, well, you can't do anything about it. But you should not to try to kill him. You should try to cooperate and, uh, and get better solutions for society. So like it's very common in, in, in these debates, which I have the privilege of hosting, is it gets more interesting towards the end. But unfortunately, we're running out of the time and out of the generosity of, of, of our host, which is, which is ERA. Uh, I wanted to hope and, and, and fare goodbye to all of you with, with the wish that we have enriched each other. That's why we're doing this uh, in an interdisciplinary manner, trying to understand universally, again, so trying to put together the small...